Genesis chapter 48. I want to I want to continue. How many of you heard last week's message? You got to hear last week's message? Well, this is kind of a part two. So uh, I, I, you're not going to have to know what happened last week in order to keep up with this week. But I would advise you, if you get a chance, go back and listen to last week's. Last week's was uh, not, I didn't write it, so I can say this. I didn't write God's word, so I can say this. I didn't have nothing to do with it. I just got to stand up here and deliver it. But that was a powerful word. That was an emotionally powerful, spiritually powerful word. Uh, it was transforming to me. It was one of those kind where that, that, uh, that when I was in study, when I was putting that on paper, guys, I was literally, some of you have been there, but as it was coming through my fingers, I was crying because I said, I can feel, I feel what God is going to do with this. So um, go back if you get a chance and listen to that. But today I want to talk about one more mountain ridge. And I want to continue the story. We talked about Joseph last week, you remember, and I won't recap the whole thing, but base, the, basic, the, the basic gist of, this, of the Joseph story, Joseph's brothers are jealous of him. They sell him into slavery. He goes to Egypt. He gets falsely accused of attempted rape uh, and ends up spending 13 years in prison from the time he's 17 until he's 30. He's in prison. Literally, he is innocent of any charge. And all of this was preparation for where the Lord was taking him. Uh, he, he gets out of prison because the Lord gives him the interpretation to a dream. He becomes second in charge of, the, of all of Egypt. God tells him what is coming as far as a famine. He tells the king how we need to prepare for the famine. Uh, and then he's in charge of distributing the goods for people there and outside the country. Which brings us back to his family who are living somewhere else, but they're starving. So they come to Egypt in need of supplies, and they don't know who Joseph is. Joseph recognizes them. It's a, it's a beautiful story of reconciliation. We talked about how that when last week, how that when uh, Joseph finally told his brothers who he was, they recognized who he was, that it was Joseph that had to initiate that reconciliation. Because they owed him an apology for selling him into slavery, for treating him the way they did. They owed him an apology, but they couldn't give that apology. They weren't in any position to give the apology. He, the one that was hurt the most, had to initiate the process for them to be able to. It says that once he told them who he was and he cried on their shoulder, then they talked to him. It, they were too ashamed. And we learned that great lesson that some of you are going to have to initiate the healing that ha happens in your life. Even though you're the one that was done wrong, you may have spent years waiting for whoever did you wrong to come and apologize. They're ne probably never coming because they can't. You will end up initiating that healing by going to them and saying, we need to, we need to reconcile and I forgive you for what you did to me because we learned last week because it was God that did all this. He, said, you, he told him, he said, you didn't put me, you put me in a pit, but you didn't sell me, you, you didn't put me here. This was God, so I would be here to do this now. And we learned that lesson. I'm giving you all that so you can kind of understand. It's at the end of his daddy's life. His dad's name is Jacob, also known as Israel. The sons go back home, tell their dad, we have found Joseph. He says for us to come back. He's in charge in Egypt. He says for us to come back there. So... Jacob and, and, his, and all of their family and all their flocks, they all moved to Egypt. And this is where we pick up the story. Here is Joseph, this huge family reunion. Everybody's back in Egypt. We're living there together. And Jacob then says, I'm an old man. I've gotten to see my son who I thought was dead. But he's alive and I've gotten to see him. I see that my family's going to be taken care of. Everything is good. I'm dying. I'm out of here. So he calls in his sons and gives them their due blessings. And some of their due blessings weren't very good. You can look at the blessings and some of them weren't blessings at all. But it was what they deserved. But Joseph received a blessing different than his brothers. I want you to look at Genesis 48 verse 21, 22, God's word. It says, then Israel, who is Jacob, said to Joseph, his son, now I'm about to die. But God will be with you. He'll bring you back to the land of your fathers. I'm giving you one more mountain ridge than your brothers. Everybody say one more mountain ridge. I'm giving you one more mountain ridge than your brothers. I took it from the Amorites with my own sword and bow. So let's keep on going from here. Joseph has been given his blessing. 
And what's ironic is you look at this and realize that Joseph is given the blessing of the firstborn son. Now, Joseph is way down the line as far as sons. Uh, of the 12 sons, he's what? What is he, 11? I mean, he's way on down the line. But yet God, is uh, through his dad, is giving him the blessing of the firstborn son. Lesson number one, just because you're younger, don't discount yourselves among the rest. Amen? Just because you're younger. Look at what 1 Samuel 16, 7 says about that. The Lord said, Samuel, don't look at his appearance or look at how tall he is because, because I rejected him. God doesn't see his human seed. You need to hear this. God looks at, uh, humans look at the outward appearance, but God looks into the heart. So many times we judge people based on stature. We judge them based on personality, uh, control, all these different things. But God is looking at the hearts of individuals and you, we will never know until we get to heaven some of the people that we, that we probably, without intentionally, we probably overlooked. When we get to heaven, we're going to find that they were some of the most important people on this planet in the eyes of God. People that we just never thought much about. We didn't hear much out of them, didn't see much out of them. They kind of flew under the radar. We didn't really know all the good they were doing. We didn't realize everything that, that, that God was using them to do. And when we're going to get to heaven, some of the big names that we think, oh, they're going to get everything. And God's going to be like, here, let me move you over to the side. Yeah, you're here. Let me, let me bring this meek one up here, this humble one, this one that nobody ever heard. Of. Let me bring them up and let me tell you all what they were all about. God looks at the heart, not as humans look at the outward thing. So keep that in mind. So here we got uh, Jacob now. He leaves these words with Joseph. And I want you to understand that the, that the words that he leaves with Joseph are going to pass on to the family for generations. How many men in this room are dads? Every dad in the room, raise your hand. You're a dad? Listen to this. I want to tell you, dad, something. A father's blessing on his child is a powerful and long-lasting blessing. Mamas are very important, very special. We talk about it on Mama's Day. We talk about dads on Dad's Day. But in the word right now, I'm simply making a statement that a dad can bless or curse his children and that blessing or that curse is going to stay with that kid for the rest of their life. So you dads, it's the power, uh, the power of your word, the power in your tongue is so important. What are you saying to your kids? Are you telling them how smart they are, how pretty they are? From the moment that my, that my babies were born, I was telling Heather, you're the prettiest baby that ever lived. She didn't have a hair on her head. Her mama used to have to stick a bow on her head with Cairo syrup. And yet I'd lean over her and I'd say, you're the prettiest baby that God ever made. Huh? I'd tell Bradley, you're the, smart, you're the smartest boy that ever lived on this planet. I mean, I, I built my children up. I wanted them to understand that they had my blessings. Now, sometimes they'll tell you that I was hard. It was hard sometimes being my kid. And they'll tell you that. But it was hard being my dad's kid. But it made me who I am. And I wanted them to be, I wanted them to be who they are. I'm proud of who they are today. They got that way because, I believe, because of a heritage and because of parents that gave a rip enough to, to hold them to a standard and, and a level of accountability and caused them to become responsible citizens and, and good followers of Jesus. So your, your power of, the power that a dad has, he instills that into his children by the things he says to them, by what he teaches them. So talk, talk, talk right to your kids. Joseph is going to live with the blessings and the promises of his father. I'm going to show you something today. It's, very, it's really cool, really cool. So <clears throat> Jacob passes away. Joseph continues his life. Many years later, Joseph now is coming to the end of his life. All right, look at Genesis 50. <coughs> Excuse me. Genesis chapter 50, verse 22 to 26. God's word. Isaac, do me a favor. Would you throw me that bottle of water right there? I was going to let you throw it, but that's all right. Preach the handling. Handling's even better. Uh, yeah, we're getting, we're getting close. Genesis 50, verse 22. That's funny. I just, did you see what I did, Jerry? I opened up the bottle. I was going to try to speak into Mike and open the bottle, and I opened the bottle and spoke into the bottle and held the mic. <laughs> Genesis 50. <laughs> Verse 22, God's word. Joseph and, I'm going to read this to you. Joseph and his, and his father's family stayed in Egypt. 
Joseph lived to be 110 years old. He saw his grandchildren, Ephraim's children. Even the children of Maker, son of Manasseh, were adopted by Joseph at birth. At last, Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die. But God will definitely take care of you and take you out of this land to the land he swore with an oath to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's one of those time, kind of days. <coughs> Excuse me. Joseph made Israel's son swear an oath. And he said, God will definitely take care of you, so be sure to carry my bones back with you. Joseph died when he's 110 years old. His body was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. Now, I want you to notice several things. These are, these are deductions I'm making from these scriptures based on the, a right relationship between a father and his son. This is a great relationship between Jacob and Joseph. This, this relationship had been strong even when the dad thought the son was dead. This had never changed. It was a strong relationship between a father and a son. The points I'm going to make to you from these scriptures today is if you choose to live in a right relationship with your father, God, he will do some things for you that happened in the life of Joseph between him and his dad. Are you ready to see what they are? Get your pen, get your paper, get ready to write these down. If you choose to live in that right relationship with your father, God, he will always, number one, care for you. That's the first thing. He'll always care for you. Now, let me show you where I got that. Genesis 48, 21. I'm going to be taking you back and forth. Remember I said the father speaks to the son. The son then passes on down to the generation. So I'm going to show you some stuff that maybe you've seen, maybe you never have. I'm about to show you how, how not ironic, but, but, but how surreal it is to me that what Jacob says and what Joseph says at the end of their life are so similar. So similar. And it's because... Of what Jacob says to Joseph makes such an indelible impression on Joseph. He then says it and passes it on to his kids. Dads, we pass on to our kids. Huh? We pass on to our kids what was passed down to us many times. Sometimes that's good and sometimes it's bad. Look at Genesis 48, 21. Back to Israel. Jacob. Jacob says to Joseph, no, I'm about to die, but God will be with you. Now jump down to Genesis 50, 24. At last, Joseph, what's Joseph say at the end of his life? He says to his brothers, I'm about to die. God will definitely take care of you. It's pretty similar, isn't it? I like what King James says. How many here has King James Version? Oh, man, I love it. Just this, just this one statement right here will preach. God will surely visit you. I love that. I love that. God will surely visit you. You know, the way that that is stated, I like, I like the way it's stated, God will visit you. And, and what, that, what happens in our minds when we hear God will visit you, we think in terms of what it means if somebody says they're coming to visit you. Vic says, I'm coming to visit you. I'm like, okay, cool, when you coming? And Vic says, I'll be over there on Saturday at 2 o'clock. So at 2 o'clock, I'm looking for Vic because he said he was going to visit me. Right? So I'm waiting for it at 2 o'clock. This has a little bit of a different meaning here. This isn't, we, like, we, like, we like that and it's part of it, but it's not just that. The term God will surely visit you means that God is going to care for. God is going to oversee or basically God's going to keep up with. So when he said, I'm going to die... But God will surely visit you. He's saying, I'm going to die, but God's still going to be overseeing you, keeping up with you, and taking care of you. Isn't that good? Joseph said, you know, dad left that to me. I'll leave that to you. God will take care of you. If you are a son or a daughter in right relationship with your father... He will always take care of you. He will always oversee your life. And he will always show up when you need. I mean, I, I, I saw something that this lady named Elizabeth Elliot, she wrote this. She said, she's kind of being sarcastic. It's kind of funny. She says, we know what we need. She's talking about prayer. She said, we know what we need, a yes or no answer, please, to a simple question. Have you ever been like that with God? God, why do you got to drag this out? 
I know what I need, and you know what I need. I know you know what I need because I've told you a thousand times. Have you ever done that? Why don't you just do it, God? Why don't you just do it? I've prayed about this. I've asked you for this. We've talked about this. You ever been like that? We've talked about this, Lord. She says, we know what we need, a yes or no answer, please, to a simple question. Or perhaps even a road sign. Just something quick and easy to point the way. That's what we're after. Am I right? We can't foresee obstacles down the road. We can't foresee those things so many times. So when we get to them, they are a huge matter of concern. Now, those obstacles that we're seeing right now, God knew was coming 6, 17, 19, 27 billion years ago, right? But we're just now getting to them. So to God, they're nothing. He's known that they were coming and what, what the result would be, how we were coming. He's known that forever, but we didn't know it was coming. So we're freaking out. And we're saying to him, you need to take care of this now. And God's like, well, I hear what you're saying, but I really don't. I mean, I don't need to take care of this now because I can see... Five days from now and I can see 50 years from now and I can see 200 years from now and and I know that you don't like the way this makes you feel and I don't and you don't like the circumstance you feel yourself in you feel trapped or whatever but I don't I don't really need to do anything more than what I've already done which is to set my will in motion in your life and to let you walk through it now that's not easy to hear but here's the point I'm making with that Though we want God to show up in those moments, what we're better off with is God being with us all the time. I don't really need a quick answer in a moment. That's what I think I need. I don't need a simple yes or no or else he'd give it. I can tell him what I need, but he knows what I need worse than I do. More than I do. So I like it when it says God will surely visit you. That paints a picture there to me of that when I'm in that moment, God won't just show up then and help me get through that and then be gone. That's the picture of God will surely visit you. He'll come to you every time. He'll show up time and time again. Every time you need. We've heard that and it's true. But I still like the idea better, the concept better of God is going to visit you on a permanent basis. God is going to stay with you. He's going to oversee your life. He's going to walk with you. He's going to care for you in this moment here and the ones before and the ones after because you're not going to have to wait for him to show up to just visit. He's going to be there all the time. So you don't have to sit your clock and say, well, God said he'd be there on Saturday at 2. God visits me all the time. Constant, I am in con- you ready I am in constant visitation with God. This is the promise of a son or daughter in right relationship with their father. He will care for you. Always care for you. He's doing stuff for you right now, and you don't even have a clue. He's opening doors right now that you don't even know need to be open five years from now. He's working, he's he's making things happen right, and you don't have a clue what God is doing on your behalf. He's doing it because he cares for you. Number two, he'll bring you back home. Look at let's go back to 48 again. Let's talk about Jacob and Israel again. Because I'm taking you back and forth. What did Israel then say? Israel said to Joseph, Now I'm about to die, but God will be with you. We just talked about that. He will bring you back to the land of your fathers. Got it? All right, let's go back to 50. Genesis 50. What did Joseph say when he died? Verse 24, at last Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die. God will definitely take care of you. What else did he say? And take you out of this land to the land he swore with an oath to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He just said the same thing. Didn't he? You see it? I'm going to take you back to the land of your fathers. Then Joseph says, God's going to take you back to the land that he swore with an oath to give to Abraham. It's the same thing. Now, you say, well, pastor, in our case, we know what that means. It means heaven. Yes, absolutely. Obviously, it means heaven. I like um, Hebrews eleven twenty two. You know Hebrews eleven. Everybody know what Hebrews eleven is. Hebrews eleven is the chapter of faith, the hall of faith chapter, right? 
So Joseph gets quoted in the Hall of Faith, Hebrews 11. Years, 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 years later. The writer of Hebrews says, while Joseph was dying, faith led him to speak about the Israelites leaving Egypt and give them instructions about burying his bones. Where are you going with that, preacher? In faith, we have the assurance that we walk with him and that when this life is over, he'll bring us home. In faith, did you hear that? In faith... We're not just walking with him through this life, but we're walking with him in faith with the knowledge that when this life is over, he will take us back home. He'll always bring us back home. I, I read a story about this uh, great Scottish preacher years ago. His name was George MacDonald. He was talking to his son one day, and they started talking about heaven. And he's, he's painting this picture for his son about heaven and how beautiful it was. And finally, his son made the statement. He said, it just seems too good to be true. Have you ever, have you ever heard anybody say that? Heaven just seems too good to be true. And I love what the dad said to his son. He said, it's just so good that it must be true. It's just so good that it must, has to be true. Heaven has to be true. For all of you that are wondering if heaven is real and hell is real. Yes, they are. And heaven is so wonderful and hell is as bad as... As heaven is good. That'll terrify you if you're over here. But man, it'll thrill, you, thrill your soul if you're over here. As a son or daughter in right relationship with your father, he will care for you throughout all of the moments of your life. And when your life is over, he will immediately bring you back to the land that he swore your forefathers. He'll bring you back home. You believe that? Our faith is in Jesus and in our Father who by the Holy Spirit leads us through this life and all the way home. And then the last one is this, number three. When we're in that right relationship with our Father, He will reward us. He'll reward you. Now, I want to spend just a minute right here because I want to show you some things. It took faith for Joseph to believe. I'm going to show you why. His dad gave him something that he never got to see or enjoy in this life. He said, what are you talking about? Genesis 48, 22. Jacob or Israel says to his son Joseph. I'm giving you one more mountain ridge than your brothers. I took it from the Amorites with my own sword and bow. Now, those of you that are scholars. Way ahead of me, you're like, wait a minute. He didn't take that with a sword and bow. He bought that. Some, right? Some of you are like, no, he, he purchased that. He purchased, Jacob purchased that land. Something happened, which is not in scripture, apparently, because the word does not lie. He had purchased that land, but the Amorites have come and taken it from him. Some, somehow, sometime throughout that period of time, Jacob rose up, went back, and took his land back from the Amorites. So he had purchased it, it had been taken, he goes back with his own sword and bow and takes it again. This was a prize that he had sacrificed to possess. How many of you are getting ahead of me already? This land that belonged to Jacob that he's given to Joseph was a prize that he had sacrificed in order to possess. And now he hands it off to his son who he loves. He hands it to his son Who's been a good son. And he wants to reward him for a life well lived. So the dad pays the price for a possession that is very important to him. And then he gifts that to a son, Joseph. Stay with me for a minute. All these years later, Joseph now, Genesis chapter 50. How old is Joseph at this point? He's 110 And he's getting ready to pass away. And guess what? He's still in Egypt. You still following me? He has never laid eyes on what he knows by faith is his possession. He knows it's his because his dad gave it to him. Are you still there? 
His father gave him this prized possession. And he's, year, he's lived 93 years in Egypt. And now he's about to lay down and die. And the gift that was important to his dad that he gave to his son, the son has never even gotten to lay eyes on that land. And yet, he knows by faith because his dad gave it to him, that it's his. I love it when y'all get ahead of me. Some of y'all just stay ahead of me all the time. Say, ooh, I know where this is going. Genesis chapter 50, verse 25. Joseph made Israel's son swear an oath. He said, God's definitely going to take care of you, so be sure to carry my bones back with you. The scripture said that Joseph died, and when he was, he was 110, they embalmed his body and placed it in a coffin in Egypt. Now, I want you to notice something. You still there? I want you to notice something. He was embalmed and placed in a coffin, but never buried. Doesn't say it. Read it. Read it. Somebody show me where, that they, where they buried him. He was embalmed. He's placed in a coffin, but he wasn't buried. Why wasn't he buried in Egypt? Because this wasn't his home. He's got a place. You still there? He's got a place. It's not here. But he's going to wait for the promise of the blessing to come that his father gave him. And it took nearly 200 years for that promise to be fulfilled. But finally the day came and Joseph made it to his reward. Look at Exodus chapter 13 verse 19. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites solemnly swear to do this. Joseph had said, God's going to surely come to help you and when he does, take my bones with you. And then one day after Moses had passed away, Joshua took over and then he completes the promise at the end of his own life. In Joshua chapter 24 verse 32, Joseph's bones, which the people of Israel had brought from Egypt, were buried at Shechem. They were placed in the plot of ground Jacob had bought from the sons of Hamar, father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of silver. The plot was inherited by Joseph's descendants. This was the land. Finally, are you still there? This was the land that had been given to him all those years ago. For 200 years, he's been waiting, laying in a box and waiting, but the day finally came. What's the point I'm trying to make? There are promises that God has made you that may not ever come to fruition on this side of your life. They may not happen until you're already in heaven. But you can go to your grave knowing that your father, if he promises you something, he is faithful. He cannot lie. He can only tell the truth. If he promised you something, he will not go back on its completion. He can't lie. He can't fail. He can't be wrong. His promise is forever and his blessings are eternal. Whatever he told you. Some of you remember right now. Promises. Things that you heard from God. You know you heard from God. Things that God said to you. They haven't came to pass. Some of you have been hurt for years. Maybe you've been really hurt. Some of you got angry and left the church or, 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 or whatever, the, whatever the case because you felt like God promised you something and it never happened. I've, I've ran into people like that that said, man, God told me 25 years ago. God told me 50 years ago. God told me 70 years ago. And he never has done it yet. But that don't mean he won't. Some of you say, I'm praying for sons and daughters that haven't come to Christ. And I'm getting old and I'm getting old and... And I'm, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be here. And they don't look like they're any closer to Jesus than they were before. I don't know if, I, if they're ever going to come to Jesus. Let me tell you something. You may be in your grave 20 years before they do, but they will. If God told you that, they will. Because the promises that God makes are true. He can't lie. Joseph made it back to the land after 93 years. I'm saying to you, don't get, don't get settled. I don't care how long you live on this planet. If you live 93 years or 110 years, you don't ever get settled with the planet. And let me tell you something else. Don't waste your time if you're young. Listen to me. Don't waste your time trying to possess this planet. Don't waste your time. Don't let your only priority be, how can I own as much of this 
planet as I can. If that's your priority, you're going to be so desperately disappointed when you pass away and have to leave it to people that's just going to fight over it. And then from somewhere in eternity, watch it all burn up anyway. Don't fight over this. Be blessed in this. Use whatever God's blessed you with to do his, to do his work. But don't fight over this. Don't stress over this. I don't care how long you live on this planet. This is not your home. It never was. You were never intended to live on this planet. What about the new heavens and the new earth? It's new. It's new. It's a new heavens, a new earth. Nobody's living here forever. This, one's, this one has a very terrible prediction that's not from the inquirer, but it's from God. God says that this thing that he created for us to have this test life is going to burn with a fervent heat. And then he's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. And we're going to rule and reign with Christ forever as the sons and daughters of God. Don't fight over this. Don't get comfortable with this. Don't don't worry about this. Do the best you can. The scripture says that whatever whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. So put your energy, put your life. Work hard, right? Work hard. Be responsible. But understand something. This is what you're not working toward owning this planet. It won't matter. 93 years. You could be on this planet for 93 years. I'm going to tell you something. We all have the same death sentence. None of us are getting out of this thing alive. Do you understand that? Pastor, I'm young and I'm strong. I was too. <laughs> None of us are going to get out of this alive unless the Lord decides to come and rapture the church before, you know, before we pass on. But we all got the same thing looking us dead in the face. It's coming to all of us. That's what makes this message so encouraging. Those of us that are son or the daughter, a son or daughter of God, we don't care because... As soon as we check out here, we start really living. You can live and you can die with the blessings and the promises of your father if you choose to. And that's what he wants for you. And this whole life is painful and difficult as it sometimes can be. It can also be a life of one more mountain. One more mountain ridge. What does one more mountain ridge equal? In Joseph's life... Jacob said to him, Joseph, you, you, I love you, and I'm giving you one more mountain ridge. It's one I fought hard to get. I'm giving that to you. I'm not going to give that to your brothers. I'm giving that to you. One more mountain ridge can equal, in your life, it can equal one more answered prayer. It can be one more healing. It can be one more opportunity to serve. It can be one more blessing received. One more promise believed. One more mountain achieved. I mean, it could be all kinds of stuff. But there's something that I want you to understand about this. When the Father, are you hearing me? When the Father gives you a gift, when He gives you a mountain ridge, you don't have to fight to get that mountain ridge. It's a gift. So whatever gifts that God gives you, you don't have to fight to get those. So if those of you that are struggling and striving and always trying to, I want this or I want, I'm trying to be this or I want to be like so and so or I want to do that, it doesn't work that way. God gifts people however he wants. He, his spirit is in people and, he, and the, fruit, the fruit of the spirit is in all, uh, in all of his children and the gifts of the spirit, he works through us however he decides at whatever moment. None of us own these gifts. But when God gives a gift to you, You don't have to fight the devil to get that gift. The father already fought the battle. Remember what Jacob said? I already took that. I'm giving that son. I'm giving that to you. I fought to get it. I'm giving it to you. The only fight I want you to be involved in now is the one against the devil from now on using those gifts and fruits against his kingdom. You don't have to fight and struggle and strain to be able to be used of God. Just relax. 
relax. And I've heard people say, man, I so badly want to be used in this gift or that gift. And I'm like, you know what? Don't, st don't stress and struggle over that. You know, Paul is like, you know, love is the only thing we all need to really be concerned the most about. And God will pick the rest. You're like, well, I really want to be able to pray for people and see them get healed. Well, I'll guarantee you, if that's what you want to do and you're in the right circumstance that God intend to heal somebody and you pray for them, they will be. But you could walk, you could, you could, you could lay hands on Jerry and, the, and God heal him and you can lay hands on Patsy and, and God forbid, not, I'm not prophesying, and she could die tomorrow. That is not a prophecy. Because you don't get to pick. You don't get to pick. You just get to be an instrument. That's all I am, folks. All I am. I am, I am walking and moving instrument that for 35 minutes on Sunday morning opens up its mouth and the spirit pours out of. And, and I'm just daring. I'm just daring. But I am a one more mountain ridge child of God. And here's what God has done for me as his son. He gives me more love, more help, more rest, more peace, more joy, more power, more comfort, more direction than any devil or demon can ever steal or stop. That's what he does for me. I'm a one more mountain ridge kid of Christ. God wants that for all of us. He fought the battle. He don't want you to fight and scratch and waste your life fighting and scratching over this or with each other. He wants to give you His Spirit and then He wants you to spend your life just beating the tar out of the devil. That's the fight. Not with people. Not over things. But with the devil. Wherever life leads you into whatever, whether that whether you're in, in school or you're in business or where, wherever God leads you, that's what he's doing. You're, you're where you are in this moment because God put you there. Some of you don't even know. You don't even know why you're where. You don't know how you got where you are. I'm talking to people perhaps right now that don't even know Jesus. And his hand is guiding them and leading, leading them through life. They don't even know. They don't even know the blessings and the promises of God that are in their life right now. They're not even serving Him. But it's because He's got His hand on you. He loves you. You're His son. You're His daughter. He's calling you. As a child of God, His blessings and His promises ensure that He'll care for you, that He'll bring you back home, and that He'll reward you. And that makes you a one more mountain ridge child, just like Joseph. I'm going to pray for you. Number one, I'm going to pray for you what Joseph talked about. I'm going to pray that God will surely visit you. How many people in this room would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I want God. I, I, and remember the definition I gave. I'm not talking about God showing up every once in a while when you're in a crisis. And helping you right away by giving you a yes or no answer or which way. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about praying for you that God would visit you in visitation over and over and over. Every step of your life, every direction, that you, every door you come to. And everything you do that God is visiting with you. He's with you in visit, constant visitation with you. Overseeing your life. Caring for you. I want to pray for people this morning and say, Pastor, pray for me because I want God to surely visit me. How many people in this room have said, ask me, I want God to surely visit me? Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Come on. We're not going to, don't, don't get uncomfortable on me. God will surely visit you. Mikey Moss, we're going to pray for you here in a few minutes. You're getting ready to go on a, a missions journey. Amen, man. I'm fired up for you. Mikey's, gonna, Mikey's been leading our one of our small groups God's opened a door for him and he's getting ready to go do some missions and he's going to be gone for a while but, uh, but, but you're going to go with us we're going to go with you and I'm going to have you come down here and have the, have the guys I'm going to have the men come and lay hands on you and pray for you and we're going to send you off when you get where you're going the devil's going to know right away your feet have hit the ground that's why I want you guys to pray for him because when the devil figures that out guess what He'll try to attack you, Mike. He's going to attack you, but there's going to be some, some adversity. 
I'm just, this is from, I have it in notes or nothing. Just the Lord said, there's going to be some adversity that's going to come your way. There's going to be some things initially. But the Lord says, I'm the one that's leading you here. I'm the one that brought you here. I'm the one that opens the doors and I will move the adversary out of your way. All right? Hang on to that. You'll need that in about two weeks. Praise the Lord. Where was I at? God will surely visit you. Those of you that are standing to your feet. Number two, all of you that would say, I want to embrace the blessings and the promises of my Father. I want to embrace the blessings and the promises of my Father. I, I, I know they're there, but I don't feel worthy. How many people say, I, I, I've read the word. I know there's blessings and promises, but I don't feel worthy. I don't feel good enough. I don't feel like God could do things for me because I, I, I have all these issues. And I, I, don't, I don't think right or act right or talk right or whatever. I don't care about all that. I'm going to tell you, you're, you're, you're in a room filled with people. We got a bunch of sinners in here. We got some terrible, we got some really good folks, but we got some terrible folks in here. We got some sinners. We got some criminals. We got, we got some folks in here that before you gave your life to Jesus, we didn't want to be anywhere around you. But hadn't God made a change in your life? And now instead of you just saying, okay, thank you, Lord, for saving me. I know I don't deserve nothing else. I'll just hide in this corner. I'm saying, no, 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 no. God says to you, I want you to embrace the blessings and the promises of my word on your life. And thirdly, I want you to leave here as one of those people that is claiming your one more mountain. What is that, what is that one more mountain right now that you're needing? Is it, is it healing for someone else or yourself? Some kind of help, some kind of direction, an answer to prayer? Whatever it is, as a child or daughter of God, you have the blessings of a one more Mountain Ridge kid. And you get to bring that. What is the one more? What's the one more thing going on in your life right now that you're like, man, I, I, this, is, this is my thing? i I got to be honest with you. I cannot remember ever a time that the whole church was standing up in an altar time. I mean, this is, this is basic, it's incredible to me because the Lord knows what we have need of. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. Pastor Victor, quit worrying about that building. I know you hadn't much. I know you hadn't worried much, but I'm just telling you, because you quit worrying about the, the Lord's fixing to open up a door for the church. Amen? It's coming. Amen. It's gonna be better than what you it's gonna be better than what you had even envisioned. He loves what you're doing, he loves what the church is doing. And so his hand, his hand is upon that. He's going to bless that, and he's going to open doors that no man can close. So you don't, as his pastor, as his servant, you don't need to worry. You don't need to worry about, he says, you don't worry about facilities. You just hang around with me. God said, you just hang around with me. I'll take care of where I'm sending you. Amen. Amen. Lord, I'm thankful today for your word. I'm thankful today that you brought us to this place. I thank you, Lord, that you show yourself to us. You love us so much that you give us confirmations. You say little things to us, Lord. You say them to us. And it gives us such encouragement. Just to know that we're your child. Just to know that we have your ear. Just to know that you're with us everywhere we go. God, we're in constant visitation with you. And that we can embrace your blessings and promises. And we can ask you for that one more mountain. Right now, God, there's mamas in this room that are asking their one more mountain is the salvation of their child has gotten away from God. That one more mountain for some is the healing of someone that they're watching suffering and they feel so helpless. That one more mountain for some is something they're not even praying for. It's patience to endure the season that's coming in their life. But you'll be with them through it. 
So we're bringing our one more mountains to you right now, Lord. But you're an awesome God. You're such an awesome God. You're such a good, good Father. Everyone in the I can say, if you're standing, come to the altar. There's not room. So right there where you're standing, you're going to lift your hands and we're going to receive from the Lord. But I tell you what I am going to do. I am going to open this up right now for someone that would say, Pastor, things aren't right between me and God, but I want them to be. I want my life to be right with Jesus. I want Him to come into my heart and forgive me for my sins. I want Him to change my mind. I want Him, I want him to help me start getting going in the right direction. I don't know who I'm talking to. I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not picking on anybody. I, I, I really don't know. I probably am going to be surprised by who responds to that. But if you'd say, man, I know that's where I got to start. I know that's where I got to start. I, want, I just want to come down and I want to get down on my knees in front, of, in front of the Lord and just tell him I'm sorry and ask him to forgive me and to take my life and point me in the right. Am I talking to anybody? If that's you. I know it takes a lot of courage in a setting like this. A lot of people look at you like, man, I don't want to get out from. I had to walk down an aisle like this one time. I do, I've done this before in front of lots and lots of people. So I know, it's, I know that it feels hard. But every step you take, it gets easier. And I promise you, you won't be down here by yourself. Because if you're a woman, there's going to be ladies that are going to jump, jump up and run down here. And if, there's, if you're a man, there's going to be men that are going to come and get with you. But I just, feel like, I just felt like I'm supposed to throw that out there this morning. I don't do it all the time, but I feel like I'm supposed to. Am I talking to anybody that would say... I need, to, I need to get on my knees in front of my creator and repent of my sins and give my heart to Jesus. Am I talking to anybody? If I am, come very quickly. Come very quickly. And we want to pray with you. Mikey, I want you to come down here and stand. I want some of you, I want some of you men that are just full of the Holy Ghost. I want you to gather around him and lay hands on him. We're going into battle, Mikey. But you're not going by yourself. We're going to go with you. Look at this. Men, we're going into battle. Men of God, we're going to lay hands on him. We're going to ordain him for this calling. We're going to ordain him for this calling and for this season in his life. And all across this room now, you stood up for whatever one of those reasons. I want you to just throw your hands in the air while they lead us in this song. Talking about he's such an awesome God. I want you to just throw your hands in the air and just let him do whatever it was that you're standing up for. Whatever you stood for, you're just going to receive that from him right now. Are you ready? Are you ready? Throw those hands up in the air. Just it's an act of surrender. Lord, I surrender. I surrender to you. And I bless you. Come on, praise team. Just lead us for a few minutes.